Today we're going to be talking about the differences between log footage and linear footage when it comes to grading, and why just adding contrast and saturation to log footage usually isn't enough to get an accurate image. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and I perceive the world with 18% grey. So I already made a previous video demonstrating how to match the colors from different cameras, and also how to manipulate your curves to take the log footage from different cameras and turn it into sort of a neutral, accurate standard. And while that video was well received, many of you asked if we could take a more beginner look at log and how to correct it a bit more easily. So that's what we're gonna do today. And for the more advanced colorists out there, I ask that you excuse some of the oversimplifications that we're gonna use in this video in order to keep this video a bit easier to digest. So I've got a few samples loaded here into my laptop, all shot on the Sony a7 III with different profiles. We've got S-Log2, S-Log3, HLG3, and then the creative standard full contrast, no picture profile mode. And for each profile, I shot this chart here from DSC Labs. So thank you to them, big fan of the products. They're the same company that sent me the Xyla 21 that I used in the dynamic range tests in those recent camera reviews. And this here is one of their Camaline charts, which are fantastic because of this 11 step crossed grayscale that you can see here, which makes it really easy to see what these log curves are doing to your image which I'll show you in just a second. But if you're somebody who's interested in making LUTs for money or just matching your cameras more precisely, I highly recommend a chart like this to dial in your accuracy. Okay, let's look at the samples. Okay, so as you can see here, I've got a bunch of different samples all the way across. The first group is just S-Log2 at different exposures and then S-Log3 at different exposures. And then two, we got three HLG3s and then this is the full contrast linear one. This is what we're gonna start with because I want to explain that 11 step crossed grayscale thing, which you can actually see on the waveform. Let's make the waveform a little bit bigger here. So if we take a closer look at this X pattern here, we can see what we're looking for when it comes to a complete linear image, which is that each step, although this isn't perfect, but each step generally should be about the same distance and that it should form almost a straight you know, 45 degree angle line in both directions. And you can see that here on this chart because from light to dark and dark to light, that's why it forms the X. And then each one of these 11 steps is a value with them both having sort of a middle gray in the middle over top of each other. And that's why this chart is handy because now when we look at one of the log shots, we'll be able to see how they differ quite a bit. So this is good. This is a finished linear image. This is when, you know, people are adding contrast and saturation to their log footage. This is what they're trying to achieve. Okay, but this will have less dynamic range if you shoot this in camera like this, which is why we use log in the first place. Now let's jump over to our S-Log2 image here. Well, first of all, we can see not only is the image very squished down on the waveform, it, has, it occupies much less of the waveform, but as we increase in exposure, because often you'll hear, I like to expose log one stop over, two stops over, so I went through those as well. Because when we're just down in the shadows here, this whole, this whole X is below middle gray, so it doesn't look that bad. You would still suggest that each step looks like they're about evenly placed, but you just haven't really expanded that waveform yet. But if we increase the exposure, so now this one is two stops over, I believe, then we can start to see how it curves off above middle gray there, where the steps below middle gray, so this one, this one, this one, and this one, all have a lot more height to them on the waveform, if you will, than the ones afterwards, especially the last three, they have you know barely any height at all compared to the first three. And this is, you're starting to see that log shape now. The distance between these values is not the same as the distance between these values. And that's gonna bring us to sort of basically the fundamental problem with, you know, quick grades of log. Now. Something to keep in mind is that when we're, talking, when we're talking about color, nothing is sort of true across the board. So not all logs are the same. You know, there's things like C-Log 1 and C-Log 3, which are already kind of contrastier, and maybe these rules don't apply so strictly to them. And then there's stuff like S-Log 3, which we can pull up a sample of that here. Let's, let's jump right over to the four stops over S-Log 3, and you can see that one's even more squished than S-Log 2. And that sort of squishing is what we're talking about, what compacting data down, which gives you the most potential for dynamic range, which is why something like 10-bit log would require a lot more bits linear in order to you know, create the same amount of dynamic range. That's why there's math conversions for that purpose. But I'm not trying to bog this video down with that. Basically, if you want to have more dynamic range and you're stuck in 10 bits, you need to use a log curve. Otherwise, you're going to run out of steps real quick if every step is evenly spaced out like in a linear, like we saw in this last one here. But the advantage of the linear stuff is that it looks great right at a camera because you're occupying the full waveform. So you have a nice amount of contrast already. 
And we're gonna talk about contrast a lot during this video. So contrast from this sense is basically taking the image, taking this squished X or whatever it is that you're shooting, a face, and spreading it out across the image, across the values, across the luminance values, or in this case, the height of the waveform. And when it reaches down lower and higher, you're gonna get darker blacks and brighter whites and it's gonna have more contrast, right? You guys know this already if you've ever edited a photo or anything. The issue is that when people do quick grades in NLEs, which I've seen a lot of YouTubers comment on this lately, and I'm not throwing any shade here, their images look great and I'm, and I'm not criticizing anything, but I have seen people evaluate the color and the tonality of a camera by saying, here's some log and I just added some contrast and saturation. And I've also seen some problems on Twitter lately of people asking, why is it when, like here, here's a quick grade I did, what's wrong with these reds or these oranges? All I did was add contrast and saturation. And I hope that we're gonna explain what happens to those reds and oranges and what happens to your face when you just add a little bit of contrast and saturation. So if you think of contrast as sort of pushing things away from the middle, if your middle isn't right and you already have sort of like a curve at the top, no matter how far you push it, you're not going to be able to get it right. So let's do one of those and find out. First, let's add contrast to our linear image here, which is an easy contrast. And I'm using Resolve, but it's pretty much the same principle if you use a contrast slider in Premiere or Final Cut or something else. The only difference is that Resolve has a pivot which we can also look at if you are new to Resolve and wondered what Pivot's all about. So let's jump down here to the contrast slider and we're just using this one node here. So I'll position it like this so we can see the actual image, our waveform and our contrast. And I'm just gonna jack the contrast way up. Now see how things are getting pushed away from the middle point there. So we have our middle gray and things are, <laughs> the space between these ones and the middle gray is increasing and things are getting more squished here and there. That's what contrast does. And if you look at the image, we've got really, really black blacks and now we're losing a lot of variation between the whites here. We don't have that same sort of nice gradation there. If we hide this and look at it, now we can see clear steps between our, our grayscale, which is what we wanted. We already had decent contrast to begin with. But now let's just adjust the contrast back down a bit and then adjust the pivot so you can see what happens there. So let's increase the pivot now and you'll notice that now the midpoint is shifting down and if we go the other way with the pivot, now the midpoint is shifting up. So if we add the pivot really, really low and then increased contrast, you see how our middle, our little middle of the X there is getting higher and higher. But if we had the pivot all the way the other way, and we increase contrast, you see how the middle point is going down. So pivot is almost like positioning where you're gonna favor, who's gonna get the more information. Is it gonna be the shadows that get the more information or the highlights to get the more information? Okay, so let's load up an S-Log2 image here. Now, by the way, if any of you are having trouble saying, okay, this is all great and he's showing an X and he's showing these values on this chart, but what does that have to do with grading a real scene? What you need to realize is that every one of these steps here is the same in essence in terms of contrast and luminance value as something else in the environment. So there's skin tone patches here and they'll have a similar value on the 11 step grayscale as something else. So this whole scene you're looking at right here could be represented by these steps on the grayscale. And if you had a camera that say had 11 stops of the dynamic range, this is essentially what you're seeing. And maybe your face is here, or maybe your face is here if you have a darker complexion. And then maybe, you know, this is your sky. And then maybe this here is like the shadow in the background. So it, it all applies even if you're not seeing contrast on a face, but we'll be able to apply it so that you can see it and obviously apply it to your own footage and it'll work. But even looking at my face now, you'll see that I have shadows and I have a, a I have a broad tonal range across my face from like highlights to shadows. And something I noticed about those YouTube things that I was questioning where I said on Twitter and on YouTube is that I'll find that often when they do just do a quick contrast and saturation in the log image, that their face will often lack tonal variation. It might look nice and the image might look good and their skin might look nice and even and everything, but that's what I'm talking about is that they're only allowing a certain amount of information for their skin rather than having it go across a whole you know, wide range of, of tonal variations. And that usually comes from not positioning log correctly in the waveform based on not respecting the fact that it has a strong curve to begin with. So if we look at S-Log2 here, this is S-Log2 exposed correctly, which by correctly, we mean according to the manufacturer's standard of setting it to like 32% or whatever it is for middle gray. We can see middle gray is way down here at, you know, that mid 30% zone. Now, when we apply a LUT from the manufacturer, which I have over here, I've got um, I've got the one actually for S-Log3. Let's, let's do S-Log3 instead. So this is S-Log3, pretty similar. You expose this one to 41% middle gray. So that means you wanna target your middle gray node there to be about 41%. And let's throw on this LUT here, which is from S-Log3, S-Gamut3Cine, 
to 709. Now, if we throw that on, now we can see that the waveform was expanded to form more of that X that we were talking about, and the steps are a lot more even. Now, you might think it's still a little bit dark. The issue is that not all LUTs necessarily respect the correct, you know, ex they might say exposed to 40%, you put it on, you find it dark. So depending on where you're getting a LUT from, they might want you to overexpose. For example, a LUT that I like a lot is from Paul Leeming, but he wants you to overexpose your image by a few stops. So if I jump over to Leeming LUT Pro 2, and I have the one here for S-Log 2, and we drop that on this image, which is quite a bit overexposed, well, now we get a complete image there. So obviously his LUT wouldn't work on the 32% exposure, but it works on this overexposure one here. And again, we get a really nice X with pretty even steps all the way up. And that lets us know that now this image has been sort of linearized and the log curve has been accounted for. But now let's say we wanted to do this ourselves. We want to do a quick grade with just contrast and saturation. So let's go to this middle one here. This is us log two, about two stops over, which puts the middle node right around 50%. So right in the middle, which you think would be the easiest one to just apply contrast to based on what I just showed you with linear. I said, just throw contrast and it pushes it to the edges, then you'll get a full image, right? Well, let's try that. Now, as we start to push the contrast up, you'll notice that all that really happens is the log aspect of this image is being accentuated. So we still have much bigger steps below than we do above, and it's still curving off like a log curve. So maybe we should adjust the pivot, right? Keep in mind that not all NLEs even let you adjust the pivot. So the idea of just adding contrast in Premiere is probably gonna make a worse effect than even what we're doing here in Resolve. So now let's adjust the pivot so we can hopefully bring that midpoint back down to about the middle. Well, okay, but we still are getting that kind of log thing in the highlights and we're still not making it look like the linear image. Let's see what our target is over here again. So with linear, we had a perfect X all the way up to just over 90% and down to probably about 6% below. So let's see if we can reproduce that again with contrast. So we'll add some more contrast to try and raise that up to 90%. And then we'll try and get the pivot there. And as you can see, we've got this really strange <laughs> curve now where it's almost like a weird S curve where we're losing information in the shadows and in the highlights. And we still don't, it doesn't look at all like our linear image. And if we look at this full screen, I would say this image is too punchy and yet we're still not even really hitting like the full range of what we could occupy even in Rec. 709. This would be what I think people do that would be passable and then they would add saturation to it. So let's do that too. Let's, um, let's, let's cool down the contrast a little bit because something else is that contrast affects the intensity of a color to your eye the same way that saturation does. Not the same way, but it also affects the intensity of a color. So if you add way too much contrast, and then add your saturation in, it's gonna be way overkill. So let's put the saturation, we'll put it afterwards because people always say contrast and saturation, but whatever. Uh, generally with log curves, I find in resolve saturation, you need like 75 to 80. That might be too much with the amount of contrast that we have, but we'll add to 75 there. And let's take a look at that image. So then we could say, okay, this image looks somewhat finished. It's It's got contrast, it's got enough saturation, it's punchy, it's finished. And this would be what I think people qualify as a quick grade when they go to look at the color accuracy of a camera, where I find this in reviews often, people will say, I added contrast and saturation, and now we can evaluate the color science. You cannot, because the luminance of these colors is incorrect. And that's one of the issues that happens here. The easiest way to see this on the waveform is you see the color chips. You can see, you know, the yellow and the red and the green. You can see how high up the waveform they are. If we switch over to say this one here, we can see that they fall in different positions. And if we switch to the leaming lot, which actually does a really good job with color accuracy, let's take a look at the relationship between this yellow patch here and the green and then the cyan, and then look at the one that we just made. Our yellow is way up here. I don't even know where our cyan is and our blue is way down here. So we're not mixing our colors well. And if we jump back and forth, even though this one's not as contrasty, so let's go ahead and add some contrast to the Leeming LUT version to try and get a similar kind of intensity going. If we switch back and forth now, look at that color shift. So look at these swatches, this one, this one, this one, and the ones below as we switch back and forth. Look at the way that they shift, the luminance of them that's changing, and it gives it such an extreme difference because the human eye is very sensitive to, to luma changes like that. So that's another issue with why you can't just do contrast and saturation and then evaluate the color of a camera because your luminance values are way off. Okay, so before we jump into how to 
fix that then, I just want to show you HLG as well, because that's another thing I got asked about a lot. How does HLG fit in this? Because it's half log, half linear in a sense, right? That's why it's a hybrid log. So if we look at these HLGs here, I got this one, I've got this one, which is about one stop over and then two stops over, which is about as extreme as you can go with HLG. And you can definitely see a bit of a log curve there at the top of the HLG. But when you're not too overexposed, it definitely represents a bit more of a linear look than the full log curves. So the question I guess would be, can you just add contrast and saturation to HLG? Well, let's give it a quick try. So for this one, you actually don't need to add a lot of saturation to HLG. And we haven't talked about saturation knowing how much is enough, but I'll do that for you in one second. So let's add a little bit of contrast here and you know, we'll adjust the pivot. Okay, so we added a bit of contrast. It's probably not bright enough because of the exposure for it. So, you know, we can increase the gain here to sort of brighten it up a little bit and give us, let's see what that looks like. Eh, looks like a pretty decent image. Now let's go over to this one and we'll apply a LUT on it. Again, Leaming LUT's got one here that's pretty good for HLG. So we'll see what a fully corrected image should look like and we can bounce back and forth. So not terrible. Again, our image I think was a little bit underexposed. But you can see that we were able to achieve the result quite a bit better with just contrast with HLG than we were with full log. And this is kind of what I was saying, that not all log curves are the same. And this also supports the idea that I recommended earlier that HLG, like a long time ago with my videos, is that HLG3 is probably a profile that would be easier to use for people than log if they want something quick. Because those quick grade principles definitely apply a little bit easier for HLG. There are still some color space conversions that need to be done. But that's what that previous video was all about. Now when it comes to determining how much saturation we need, which I just said we talk about, if we change this to the vector scope instead, we can see the color swatches and them approaching these target boxes on the vector scope. And there's a couple things you can do here. If you don't have a chart in your shot, so you don't know if your colors are falling in the correct zones. By the way, this lets you know that our, our own HLG that we did is not exactly that color accurate. Let's look at the leaming one much better, they're all falling in the boxes. But what we can do is look at our skin tone if we have skin in the shot. And this is our skin tone line and you can see the different skin patches here. Generally for fairer skin tones, like I would say mine and in this image here, we can see that they're referring to the lighter skin values. You'd want them to come up this skin tone line, which is this one here, about, I would say about 40% of the way up. And the darker your skin is, the less high up that line it's gonna go. But if we combine all this information now, and what does it mean that how, how do we do it if we're not going to do it with contrast and saturation? I think that we can use all these mistakes to figure out a fix. And I'm going to go down to the curves here. And what I'm going to try to do is recreate as best I can this linear image with S log 2 by just adjusting the curve. I'm just going to do this really quickly. I'm not, I'm not going to try that hard on it because I don't want to waste too much of your time. But I'm basically just going to try and get our midpoint there to fall around that 512 point. And then I'm just gonna adjust the curve until the steps look like they're occupying a similar height for each step. And if I see an area that looks like it's not too even, then I'm gonna come in and just add another little point on the curve and fix it. And you do need to be careful doing this if you add too many points and if your positions of the points are too sharp then you'll end up with weird extremes where like the color resolution might break apart and you'll see like weird bands that you don't like. So try and be not too extreme with it. Keep it somewhat conservative. And I don't know, something like this. Again, I don't want to spend too much time. But you can see, if we jump back, we'll just take a quick peek. There's the linear one. There's the one I do with the curve. It's pretty close, right? And if you're watching those color bars while I was adjusting the curve, you probably would have seen them shift position. So now we do still need to add saturation. So let's go into our second node there and we'll add that, I don't know, 75 saturation in. And now you can see those colors, if I just undo and redo, you can see them get their saturation. But based on their luminance, if I hide this one and then put it back and hide this one and put it back, you can see that there's more at play than just saturation. Now let's take a look at our vector scope and I would say, our, yeah, we're pretty good. We're hitting probably around 40% for the bulk of our skin tones. Our red is right there. We've got nothing outrageous. And now at this point is where you would need to correct for the fact that often logs might be using different color primaries, you know, maybe 2020 instead of 709, or maybe they just have, you know, a certain flavor to them that they like to favor certain things and you don't find it accurate or you can't match it with other cameras. So that's when we go in and do the other steps that I mentioned in the previous video. So now at this point, if we wanted to, we could go in and add a little bit of contrast if we felt like our image wasn't punchy enough or we wanted to, you know, get a certain vibe to it. But we should use it more as like a finishing touch that makes the image a bit more 
you know, a bit more punchy, but also keep in mind, you might then have to roll back your saturation a little bit because again, contrast, as I can show you here, if I add a bunch, will make your colors look a lot more intense as we just saw. So then you might need to dial back your saturation in order to make that work. But this will be up to you, but we should use it more as a finishing touch is what I'm trying to say, rather than a, a way to correct log footage. Now, if we do switch back and forth between this one and the linear to sort of see how we did, uh, we can see that our X pattern is pretty close. Our colors aren't exactly the same, even though I would say the intensity of the colors is pretty similar. And that's because I corrected the colors of the log image where the standard has its own flavor of color, which, you know, isn't exactly accurate if that's what you're going for. This is standard. You can see it kind of has almost like a hue twist to it where ours is a little bit more accurate. And the most important part is the gradations and finality between the different ranges. So if we look again at the linear image, we can clearly see distinct separations between the white and the different nodes of gray all the way down to the black. And if we do this on the image that we corrected with the curves, we still have that. Where if we look at the one that we did with just contrast, I think that we have a lot less separation between these high values. And that's usually what I think creates that sort of plastic skin with very little tonality in the skin. It's that kind of squeezing of the highlights that is still kept if you only add contrast. Okay, so before we jump into some Twitter questions, I wanna give you just a couple quick practical demonstrations because I know so far this has been highly theoretical and it might not be that useful if you're like, well, what am I supposed to do on, <laughs> on set if I don't have you know one of these charts or whatever? Like, how am I supposed to line up my X's or whatever? So I can give you sort of a quick little range of something you can do with your curves to make it work or what you should be looking for. And I will show you just sort of roughly what you have to do with the curves to make this work. So if you have a log image that's overexposed, you're gonna to wanna to grab the curve probably, generally you wanna grab it around where you're midpoint is. So if your midpoint is up around the 60, 70%, you're going to want to grab it up here and you're going to want to pull that down. And as you can see, that will give you sort of that X back. Doing this will put you in better shape to add just contrast and saturation if that's what you need. This is what happens if it's overexposed. You need to kind of like invert the log curve. If you have a completely you know, neutral exposure, which would be say maybe this one where you're right at 50%, then you can try going for a little bit of like an S curve style, but you'll find that your midpoint will still need to be adjusted in order to make that work. So you're going to want sort of an S curve like this, where the midpoint is still brought down a little bit because once you boost it up enough based on log squeezing everything down, this will give you know, this is, this is for like a 50% middle gray type of curve. Then let's do one if you're exposed by the book. So with S log two, you might be at 32%. Often you'll find these logs, they want themselves 32, 35, 40, somewhere in that zone usually. So if you're one of those lower exposures, you can see already just from this histogram that we're all the way down here. So we're gonna look where we are. We're in like that 30% 30 per, 30 zone. We're gonna grab further down on the curve and then bring that up to bring up the entire well, our entire X pattern, which again represents all the values of our scene. And then if we want to boost our highs even more, we can, you know, try and like finesse this curve up here as we bring this up. And you'll have to kind of adjust the roll off so that it's not too extreme for you. And then again, your midpoint's now going to be adjusted, but you got to be gentle with this because you're doing such a boost. But if we jump between these two, other than the fact that you can tell that I achieved this exposure difference using uh, f-stop because our background is different, we can see that we actually have a a reasonably similar image between these two, but look at the two curves. So exposure when you're low, you make a curve like this. When your exposure is high, you make a curve like this. If you're somewhere in the middle, you're going to make a kind of S curve. And then for all three of these examples, you could go in and add like a 75 saturation. And then you'd have to add a third node for fixing the color inaccuracies. And then those three things together would comprise sort of a, a correction LUT, that would be your LUT. And then after that, again, you could add more contrast. So let's say that we did our color corrections here, then we could add a fourth node, and then we could add some contrast if we wanted to make the image a little bit more punchy, and then finesse our saturation again to make that work. Okay, again, I hope that that information was helpful. I don't know how long this video has been running for. I was gonna do this as a live stream originally, but I thought that might take even longer. So I'm gonna jump over to Twitter, because you guys had some questions when I said that I was gonna do a video like this. So let's just check and see what some of your Twitter questions were. And it looks like our Twitter questions are gonna be brought to you by Lawnmower Sounds. I don't know if you can hear them, but if you can, I apologize, but we're just gonna motor on through. So there's a question here from Jake that asked about why Canon Color Science, you know, can you not just make that with other cameras to match the Canon look? And the answer is yes. Between that last video and this video, I think I've demonstrated that you can definitely, you know, make anything look like anything. Some are harder than others, and some logs are more finished than other logs. But if you have the time in post, 
color science isn't really that important. I would say color science is only important if you need to work quickly and you want a look straight at a camera, then you should probably prefer the camera that gives you the look that you like because it'll make your life easier, especially if you're gonna shoot like that last clip I showed you, which was the linear standard full contrast one. That's when color science will play the biggest part because that image is already complete. So choose a camera that, if that's how you're gonna shoot, choose a camera that has a complete image that you like already. Question here about bitrate. This is a good question that comes up a lot. How important is bitrate as a factor? Generally, the answer is not really. You only really need enough bits in order to achieve the image. Beyond that, bitrate is more useful for, like when you compare, you're comparing 100 megabits per second versus 400 megabits. Usually that's the difference between an all intra and an IPB, which is about, you know, editing performance and that kind of thing. It's not really gonna make a big difference in terms of color. A color value is still a color value. In that case, bit depth is a lot more important. I wouldn't worry so much about bit rate. I would worry more about bit depth and chroma subsampling and color resolution, which you do need a certain amount of data in order to achieve. But once you've achieved that sort of level, having more bits doesn't give you better color in a sense. Hopefully that's helpful. There's a couple questions in here talking about correction LUTs. So definitely if you get a new camera and you wanna shoot log, I highly recommend that you go to the manufacturer's website and see if they have a LUT available. Those ones that I was using from Sony came from the Sony's website. When I made that video about Canon before, I used the one from Canon's website. The Leeming LUTs, however, those are third party LUTs that he makes in order to make different cameras match together because Sony's LUTs don't have to match Canon's LUTs. They're not working together necessarily, right? And then there's also ACES, which is a whole nother thing. But it, basically, yeah, go to the manufacturer's website and see if you can get a LUT, drop that on. That'll do a lot of the work that we just talked about today for you. And then you can just do those contrast and saturation adjustments because the correction of the curve, making it from log to linear and fixing your primaries, like, that would already be done for you. So this is sort of in lieu of a LUT, but if the manufacturer has a LUT that works for you, definitely get that. Something to note though, is that you can still use the same principles I showed you on the curve if you shot your image wrong for the LUT. So if you shot your image too bright for a LUT, I can show you this right now, or too dark, you can still use those same curves to reverse what you did to make the LUT work. For example, let's go to this shot here, which is too bright for the Sony LUT. If I go to the Sony, this is like, I think like a two or three stop over. If I pop on this Sony LUT here, that image is, is out of whack. Look at the waveform. It's still like way up top here and everything. But now we can reverse that curve that we're seeing here in our curves to make the image make sense. So again, look where the midpoint is, about 768, so like 75% area. So go up here, grab it, pull it down a little bit until your midpoint starts to make more sense. And then you still get the benefit of that LUT. All those corrections are there. And we just sort of scooped down our waveform to compensate for that. So again, still using the manufacturer LUT but now we reversed our overexposure. And if we were underexposed, which I actually have an example of, let's go here. Uh, I actually just used the S-Log3 lot on S-Log2, so don't do that <laughs> because your colors won't be right. This is an S-Log3 image that might be a little bit underexposed. Let's drop that on and see. Yeah, we're a little bit underexposed. So now we'll do the opposite. We'll grab down here a little bit and we'll boost that up. And then we can boost up our highs as well until we get that image back to form that X. So you can still reverse, if you're underexposed or overexposed for a lot, you can still undo that over underexposure with your curves using the same examples that I showed you throughout this video. And I think that's a good point to end the video on actually because the lawnmower has stopped, perfect timing. Uh, I hope that this video was helpful. Obviously whenever we get into these videos, I'm like, I'll just, I'll just pop open Resolve and we'll just ramble at the camera for 30 minutes. I never know if this information is gonna be useful to you guys at all, but I hope it was. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments if you've got some you know, other questions or more confusion, and maybe we can try to bundle all those together for a future video. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining, or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure to leave the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, trust in the playback speed to 75%. All right, I'm done. <laughs>